What Mike Babcock recently did was both monumentally and historically bad. Babcock's coaching career has been one full of controversies that date all the way back to his Detroit days. And while yes, he's been a successful coach and even hoisted a Stanley Cup, wins and overall experience doesn't excuse his behavior. Unless you're Columbus, that is. I am very disappointed. The last time we heard about Babcock prior to this season was way back before COVID, where after signing a massive eight-year deal to coach the Maple Leafs, he would get fired just three years in due to a report that came out about the way he treated young forward Mitch Marner. Babcock would tell Marner to rank his teammates in order of overall performance. Mitch assumed it was a weird request, but did so to avoid losing ice time. And despite Mike claiming it was going to be confidential, he would then go on to read Marner's list out loud in front of the entire Leafs dressing room. This came as a shock for some, but for those who previously worked for him, it was nothing out of the ordinary. As even before this incident, players like Johan Franzen, Mike Commodore, and Mike Medano had to face unfair consequences that affected their careers. I feel these are important to go over for context purposes, but especially one moment in particular. Commodore's incident involved Babcock claiming to the media that he came into practice out of shape. Despite Despite that claim being false, per the defenseman, it would ultimately go on to affect his career. Medano seems even worse and extremely distasteful, especially when you look at his games played. Medano finished his career playing in 1,499 games. The reason why he missed the 1,500 milestone by just a game is because Babcock made him a healthy scratch during the final game of both the regular season and what would be Medano's final game of his career. But no other incident made be worse than the Johan Franzen one, as Babcock not only went after younger players, but aging veterans as well. The Wings were recently struggling, and instead of trying to face the adversity during the game, he would take out his anger on Franzen, screaming at and berating him on the bench in front of the entire team. Franzen, recently struggling with injuries and depression, would completely break down, and this moment would eventually play a factor in his decision to retire. Babcock knew he could be hard on players who were more on the quieter side, and since most of the other scapegoats left out of frustration, he, for some reason, took everything out on Franzen. Wings defenseman Chris Chelios would describe the moment as one of the worst he's ever saw, and Franzen would state in a later interview that Babcock was both a terrible person and a bully. This this leads us to his incident in Columbus, where reports would come out that Babcock was inviting players over for a one-on-one -on -one meeting and then would proceed to look at the photos on their phone. This obviously being an invasion of privacy and just plain weird, clearly rub most players the wrong way. And on the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Paul Bizanet would expose these accusations in full support of the players. The accusations ended up being completely true, and Babcock would get fired before even coaching a single game for the Jackets. Perhaps the only humorous thing to come out of all this is that Babcock actually made history. As when looking at the coaching stats, Mike ranks in the top 10 all time in Blue Jackets history for wins despite never coaching a single game. This of course will change once Vincent takes over, but nonetheless, it's funny to point out. Babcock's firing got me curious however. I wanted to see if there were other coaches who had extremely short tenures before being let go. And for clarity, I know there have been a ton of coaches to get fired after just one game, but those coaches were with organizations in previous years. I'm talking about freshly hired head coaches who almost immediately got the axe for one reason or another, whether it was on their own merits or due to a decision made by management. And our first coach takes us back to the 92-93 season. Bob Plager is a St. Louis Blues icon. On the ice, he was a feared, hard-nosed player who always gave 110%, but off of it, he was an enormous personality and described as being larger than life. He would be a part of the Blues organization for almost half a decade, serving in a handful of roles. After he retired from playing for the Blues, he would take a job in the front office, where he would be credited with developing the process of advanced scouting. Plager would also serve as vice president and director of players' development but would be moved around the organization again after winning a Turner Cup coaching the Rivermen in the IHL. Because of his coaching success, Plager would be named the head coach of the St. Louis Blues and was tasked with the goal of getting them out of the second round. The only problem with this hiring, however, was that Plager was never really happy having to serve this new role. Because of this, 
he would only coach 11 games for the Blues before resigning to return to his vice presidential position. Originally, he was going to resign after coaching just 10 games. However, he agreed to stick around to coach the game versus the Pittsburgh Penguins. Why? Well, because the man behind the bench for the Penguins, Scotty Bowman, was a man Plager considered a mentor and thought very highly of him. Some may call it a storybook ending, as Plager's Blues would defeat Pittsburgh, allowing Bobby to walk away with a W over his longtime inspiration. Another man considered a franchise great would also try his hand at coaching, who, like Plager, also walked away on his own merits. Throughout the 1940s and 50s, there was perhaps no better goal scorer than the man they called the Rocket. Maurice Richard was a hockey icon during his time donning the Canadian sweater, and his impact on both the organization and the league itself was monumental. He scored so much that the NHL even gave him his own award, given to the player who scored the most goals in a season. But what many don't remember is that once Richard hung up the skates, he tried exchanging them for a spot behind the bench. Upon his retirement, Frank Frank Selke gave him a spot in the organization as team ambassador and eventually would promote him to vice president. But over the next several years, the Rocket and the Habs grew apart, mainly due to Richard wanting to be a part of the organization's operations. And when Selke was forced to retire, it set him over the edge, refusing to be associated with the team. Because of this and the fear of being forgotten, he did a ton of promoting and advertising for a handful of products. Hey Richard. Two minutes for looking so good. Look as young as you feel with Grecian Formula 16. But in 1972, Richard decided to take another side quest. The recently introduced WHA was looking for several positions to be filled on a handful of teams. The Quebec Nordiques were in need of a coach, so Richard decided to make his return to hockey. Bringing in a major name like Richard was super exciting, and especially for a new franchise. How excited was the Rocket? Well, not as much as you would hope as after just two games behind the bench, he decided the strain of being a coach was simply too much for him to handle, stepping down and getting replaced by another Maurice, who only lasted 76 games. Richard managed to post a record of 1-1 one one before stepping down, but his story goes to show that coaching can be a lot to handle, and just because you were a star on the ice doesn't always mean your skills will translate behind the bench. We're going to end today's video talking about another, at the time, confusing hiring. Much like the hockey world was shocked that the Jackets brought back Babcock, back in 2008, fans were almost just as shocked when the Lightning announced that Barry Melrose was going to be named their new head coach. Melrose was an analyst on ESPN when this hiring was announced, and hadn't coached an NHL team since... 1995. 13 years since his last tenure as a head coach, Melrose had the task of helping the struggling Lightning. Almost immediately, there were several red flags about this hiring, with the main one, of course, being how he was going to adapt to an evolving league. The coaching tactics of the 1990s were mainly considered stale at that point, and being away from the game for over a decade, many feared there would be a disconnect between Barry and his players, and almost immediately, there would be just that. Melrose's Lightning would struggle immensely out of the gate, being one of the worst goal-scoring teams in the entire league. But the biggest failure during his tenure was how he utilized his talented players, specifically Steven Stamkos. Stamkos was the first overall pick from that year's NHL draft, and instead of trying to give him as many chances as possible to showcase his talents, Melrose would instead bury Stamkos in the bottom six, giving him as little as six minutes of ice time a night. This, of course, would only allow him to score two goals in the team's first 16 games and notch just four points in total. Many believe this was the main focal point that led to his firing, as after just 16 games and a record of 5-7-4, the Lightning would fire Melrose and replace him with interim head coach Rick Tockett. Barry wouldn't take kindly to the firing, resulting in a war of words between Barry and Lightning owner Len Barry. The two would go back and forth in the media for almost two months with Melrose stating that he hopes Tampa Bay doesn't win a game in the next year and that, quote, Steven's gonna be a good player. 
right now, he's just not strong enough physically to play against defensemen who are 6'3", 6'4", that can skate as good as him. Well, upon Tockett's arrival, he saw the potential Stamkos had and immediately increased his ice time. He gave him more opportunities to showcase his skills, and Stamkos would finish the year scoring 17 more goals and 42 points. And as for Melrose's media battle with Barry, maybe he should have listened to him. As Barry would state that, quote, everyone knows this kid is a star, and a star he was. As the following season, with an increase in ice time, he would take home the Rocket Richard trophy, scoring 51 goals and proving that he was in fact the player this franchise was looking for. One who would eventually lead them back to glory.